territories of the former Soviet Union have become some of the most war-torn and ethnically tense regions in the world. Today the region is made up of 15 independent countries as well as several self-declared independent countries with various degrees of autonomy. Ethnic tensions in the last 30 or so years have seen multiple wars break out between different groups, most being secession movements. The recurring themes among these wars are ethnic tribalism, historical persecution and changes in alliances. It's factors like these that have been the barrier to peace in the region for the last 30 years. To understand these tribal-like conflicts, it's helpful to start by examining a former Soviet region that was hit the earliest and the hardest by its divide and rule strategy, the South Caucasus. For centuries, the Caucasus had been ethnically, culturally, linguistically and religiously diverse and a battleground at the crossroads of several empires. The mountainous region was conquered by the Ottoman Empire in the 16th century who fought over the land with the various Persian empires in the 18th. In the early 19th century, the land was conquered by the Tsarist Russian Empire. The historical land of ethnic Armenians was still occupied in part by the Islamic Ottoman Empire, who during the First World War would go on to commit a genocide against mostly Christian Armenians living within their territory, mostly in the northeast, resulting in the slaughter of one and a half million people in what would be known as the Armenian Genocide. Around the end of the First World War, the Russian Tsardom and the Ottoman Empire both collapsed, and the Transcaucasian Democratic Federative Republic became independent, eventually splitting into three separate states, Georgia, Armenia and Azerbaijan. After the Russian Empire had fallen in 1918, war broke out over the disputed border between the Christian Armenians and the Shia Islamic Azerbaijanis. The communities of these two main ethnic groups were geographically woven into each other throughout both the modern day countries, but armed militias from both groups fought for what they believed was their own rightful territory. The war went on for two years until the Russian Civil War spilled into the region in April 1920 with the Bolshevik Red Army invasion of Azerbaijan. The Treaty of Sevres was signed in August by the main powers involved in the First World War, including the Ottoman Empire. This granted Armenian independence and part of the new state was to include former Eastern Ottoman territories. But throughout November of the same year, Armenia had to defend themselves in two different wars as Turkish militias fought from the west to annex Western Armenia into the new Turkish Republic and the Red Army fought from the east to annex the remainder of Armenia into what would be the Soviet Union. The next year, Georgia suffered the exact same fate after most of it fell into the Bolsheviks, with the remainder becoming part of Turkey. The three countries became the Transcaucasian Soviet Federative Socialist Republic in March 1922, which was merged with Russia, Belarus and Ukraine to form the Soviet Union in December. The Soviet Union recognised the three constituent countries within the Transcaucasian Republic as it appears here, but authorities in Yerevan, the Armenian capital, requested that Moscow adjust the borders to make them historically accurate. So in July of 1923, Soviet General Secretary Joseph Stalin redrew the map. Armenia claimed all of its own land within the Transcaucasian Republic as well as these provinces here within Azerbaijan, Nakhchivan, Zengazur and Karabakh. With Stalin carrying out his divide and conquer tactics, he allowed Azerbaijan to keep Nakhchivan, ceded Zengazur to Armenia and created what was known as the Nagorno-Karabakh Autonomous Oblast which loosely covered the Karabakh province. The borders were largely based on the demographics at the time as the oblast population was over 90% Armenian. 14 years later, the republic was officially split into the Georgian, Armenian and Azerbaijani Soviet Socialist Republics, but the Nagorno-Karabakh Autonomous Oblast remained part of the Azerbaijani Republic and like Nakhchivan was an Azeri Autonomous State. When Mikhail Gorbachev became General Secretary of the Communist Party in 1985, he relaxed restrictions on freedom of expression, including political dissidents and nationalism. As the Soviet Union's grip on power throughout its republics began to weaken, the autonomous government in Nagorno-Karabakh decided to pass legislation in February 1988 that declared the oblast to be part of Armenia. This was effectively undermining Azerbaijan's sovereignty over the region and ethnic tensions and occasional violence broke out in Karabakh, especially in the areas where the communities were woven into each other, which was mostly outside of the autonomous republic. The Supreme Soviet of the Soviet Union rejected the vote for the oblast to become part of Armenia in March and forces were sent into Yerevan to quash any protests against this. Militias on both sides used force against civilians of each ethnicity living in the other country and thousands of people fled or were deported, eventually settling in their country of origin. 
When Azerbaijan declared its independence in October 1991, it carved up the Nagorno-Karabakh Autonomous Oblast between its own declared provinces. This didn't sit well amongst the Armenians living there and interracial violence escalated. To protect the Armenians living in Azerbaijani territory, Armenia invaded Azerbaijan from the west and Armenian militias within Nagorno-Karabakh helped consolidate its jurisdiction over its own territory in what would be known as the Nagorno-Karabakh War. It lasted until 1994 and ended in a decisive victory for Armenia and Nagorno-Karabakh. Today, Armenia has de facto jurisdiction over the Nagorno-Karabakh region, also known as the Republic of Artsakh, yet the oblast retains some autonomy except for the parts Azerbaijan controls. The oblast is a self-declared independent country but doesn't have any recognition from any UN member, including Armenia. Very few Azerbaijanis live in the parts of Western Azerbaijan controlled by Armenia given the massive demographic change in both countries following the ethnic violence. The Armenians living there want to either become an independent nation or more likely join Armenia, but Azerbaijan still claims it as its own de jure territory being occupied by Armenia. Since the war ended in 1994, the state of the conflict remained largely stagnant for the next 22 years but for some occasional minor conflict. In April 2016, more skirmishes in the border occurred which resulted in a few hundred military deaths, making it the biggest frontline battle since 1994, but the state of the conflict basically remained the same. Today, Azerbaijan claims that Armenia violates international law by occupying its western territory and that Nagorno-Karabakh violates their laws by illegally declaring independence. Armenia, on the other hand, claims that its occupation of Azerbaijan isn't a violation of international law because they're there to keep the Armenians living there safe from persecution. The lack of any political resolution to the conflict, yet mostly peaceful status quo, has resulted in some referring to the conflict as a frozen war. While this conflict was bubbling up into all-out war, more conflict was brewing in the North Caucasus. The Soviet Union was made up of 15 republics, but many of them had autonomous regions within their own territories, with Russia having the most. These included the republics of Dagestan and Chechnya, both Muslim-majority regions in the North Caucasus. The Muslim population living there had tried to create their own independent state following the fall of the Russian Empire in 1917, but these ambitions were quickly thwarted when the Red Army took Russia's territory back before eventually conquering the South Caucasus. Stalin's divide and conquer strategy was enacted in the North Caucasus by splitting the region into multiple autonomous states. While the Soviet Union was defending itself from the Nazi invasion codenamed Operation Barbarossa, the German forces the Wehrmacht made it all the way to the borders of the North Caucasus in the late summer of 1942. Stalin accused the Muslims living in the Autonomous Republic of Chechnya of cooperating with the Nazis to try to secede from Soviet rule and deported almost half a million Muslims to the Soviet Republic of Kazakhstan, which also had a Muslim majority. Stalin continued his attempts to Russify the North Caucasus, settling ethnic Russians in the region and turning the Chechen capital Grozny into a Soviet Russian city with Russian speakers. Nikita Khrushchev replaced Stalin as general secretary after his death in 1953 and openly criticised his policies, eventually allowing the Chechen people to return to their homeland as part of his de-Stalinization process. By the 1980s, the Chechens became the majority there again, but ethnic tensions remained high between Russians and Chechens due to vast cultural clashes. By the turn of the decade, the Soviet Union was crumbling and Chechnya eventually followed other Soviet republics by adopting a declaration of independence in November 1990 under the leadership of a fierce nationalist, Jokar Judaev, who had purged the republic of its communist leaders. Much of the Russian settler population left Chechnya following the declaration as Russia's first president Boris Yeltsin began his attempts to westernize Russia following the failed Communist Party coup in August 1991. In October, Yeltsin announced a series of quick fix market-based reforms along the lines of what's known as economic shock therapy. He removed the Communist Party's price controls and took on Soviet debts as part of the process of being its legal successor on the international stage, despite half the Soviet population collectively being in the other 14 member states. Yeltsin had to privatise tens of thousands of public service companies as part of his quick reforms, giving the chance for individuals to purchase shares in them. But this mostly resulted in administrators appointed by the communist regime becoming the owners of their respective companies. This small group were known as the nomenclatura and assassination attempts by various militias took place against them all over the country. Bribery, chaos and corruption eventually led to a small group of government officials and rich crime bosses owning vast amounts of Russian wealth. Turning Russia into an effective oligarchy from a planned economy so quickly in his willingness to implement a free market made Yeltsin suddenly disliked among the Russian population, especially following the 1998 Russian financial crisis that resulted in the Soviet debt and quick reforms. But Western leaders took kindly to him. 
Yeltsin was having a hard time keeping the new Russian state legitimate given his lack of popularity, which wasn't helped by his friendliness towards the United States and Western Europe, and not to mention his alcoholism. So following the Soviet collapse, Yeltsin was too busy with Russia to worry about Chechen separatism. When Russia and then the last Republic Kazakhstan declared full independence from Soviet rule in December, it had effectively broken into 15 independent countries. But when Judaev found out that Russia would not recognise Chechnya's independence, he declared that Chechnya wouldn't recognise Russia's. With ethnic tensions rising between the Chechens and non-Chechens, mostly Russians, Ukrainians and Armenians, more of them began to flee from the Republic. After Judaev survived a failed coup attempt the next year, he consolidated his power by dissolving the parliament, giving himself effective rule by decree, which he used to further militarise the Republic to bolster its defensive capabilities should war break out. In December of 1994, that's exactly what happened. Yeltsin decided to try to bring Chechnya back under the Kremlin's control, and his air forces weakened the Chechen capital Grozny with airstrikes before tanks were sent in to secure the area. Or so they hoped. Chechen militias used guerrilla warfare tactics to catch the Russian forces by surprise, which resulted in mounting Russian casualties before forcing a ceasefire by taking hundreds of hostages in a hospital in the Russian city of Budinovsk. This move was led by the commander of the Caucasian Mujahideen, Shamil Basayev. With the Chechen guerrilla resistance proving to be more trouble than it was worth, a peace agreement was eventually signed in August 1996, known as the Hasav Yurt Accord. Russia agreed to leave Chechnya, which gave the breakaway republic de facto independence, but with recognition only from the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan run by the Taliban. The agreement outlined that the issue could be put on hold until 2001, during which time Chechnya would be allowed to operate under its own sovereignty. Over the next few years though, Chechen sovereignty would fade as the Republic became more and more decentralised with warlords beginning to take up arms and enforce local Sharia law, reportedly even with some international backing. These warlords would declare the struggle against Islam's enemies as a jihad and throughout August and September of 1999 try and unite the region's Muslim population by invading the Republic of Dagestan in the east. The problem was that this was considered a direct invasion of Russia. Around the same time, a series of apartment bombings that killed nearly 300 people took place in multiple Russian cities. The new Prime Minister Vladimir Putin blamed the Chechen warlords and subsequently declared the Chechen government to be illegitimate and outlined a plan to bring the region under direct Kremlin control. Putin's fierce nationalism and vows to avenge Russia for the attacks, coupled with his self-portrayal as the strong man, earned him much more popularity in Russia. Some reports have actually suggested that the bombings were staged by the Kremlin to boost support for the Prime Minister, but after quashing these theories, the Russian government launched the campaign into Chechnya with endless bombardment from their tanks and planes. During this on Hogmanay 1999, Yeltsin resigned and Putin replaced him as president. After a successful bombing campaign and siege of Chechen capital Grozny, Putin's forces had Chechnya back under Russian control by May of 2000, having reduced large parts of the capital to rubble. Chechnya was now under direct Russian rule, but guerrilla insurgency groups still fought against the Russian government, including through ambushes, kidnappings, hostage taking and suicide bombings, many of which were led by Basayev, who became Russia's most wanted terrorist. Putin knew he had to let Chechnya retain its autonomy so it would be less of a responsibility for him, and also to try to somewhat appease the population to try to reduce violence from Chechen terrorists and warlords. So in 2003, Putin appointed his ally Ahmad Kadyrov as the new Chechen leader. This was in the hope of rebuilding the republic and helping build peace between Moscow and Grozny, but the insurgency continued. On May 9, 2004, the VIP seating for a stadium hosting the annual Second World War V-Day military parade was blown up, killing 30 people, including the targeted man Kadyrov. His son Ramzan Kadyrov was appointed Deputy Prime Minister the next day, then eventually President of Chechnya in 2007. Since then, he has cracked down on any further insurgencies, though this was made slightly easier when Basayev accidentally mishandled a landmine which blew up and killed him in 2006, though this could have possibly involved Russian security services somewhere down the line. Since then, Chechnya has been mostly at peace, which has allowed it to have undergone a significant transformation from the war-term region that it once was. However, human rights violations are still common, and in the last few years, reports have emerged of gay men in Chechnya being kidnapped, tortured, and eventually killed by its authorities. But Kadyrov denies these reports and has used propaganda on social media to try to portray himself as compassionate. Pretending he's an animal lover on Instagram, as well as hosting Western celebrities in Chechnya, are deceitful tactics that Kadyrov uses to mask the truth of his brutality. 
Nonetheless, he still portrayed the Chechen Harban stereotype on his Instagram with videos of his training clips and risky provocative encounters with predatory animals. But at the same time, he's also used videos like this. These contrasting sets of portrayals have been Kadyrov's tactics to be the apparently strong but compassionate reader. However, Kadyrov has also posted this video of a Russian opposition leader in a sniper eye shot referencing the apparently mysterious death suffered by Vladimir Putin's critics and dissidents. This signaled that Putin and Kadyrov's relationship, which had always appeared so strong on the surface, was perhaps decaying. But by the end of 2017, Kadyrov's time in social media was up and he was banned from Instagram and Facebook. Kadyrov claimed these sites were caving into pressure from the US government. Human Rights Watch has reported that upwards of 100 gay Chechen men have been kidnapped and tortured by Kadyrov's regime. Kadyrov has repeatedly but not so convincingly denied these claims, including in this HBO interview with David Scott, where he stated that gay men didn't exist in Chechnya and if they did, Scott should take them to Canada. He then referred to gay men as devils and not people. Unable to run a third consecutive term as Russian president, Putin had to step down to prime minister again in 2008 and was replaced as president by Dmitry Medvedev, his former prime minister. Kadyrov's clear commitment to Islam and clear Chechen national identity, yet mostly solid relationship with Putin and Medvedev has been a sufficient compromise to keep the insurgency and conflict at a low enough level since they officially ended the Second Chechen War in April 2009. The Kremlin delegates the job of cracking down on Chechen separatism on Kadyrov and it appears they will be content for the long haul and are undeterred by Kadyrov's human rights abuses. We remain in the Caucasus for the next conflict to cover following the Soviet collapse, which originated from uprisings in Georgia, most notably in the breakaway regions of Abkhazia and South Ossetia. Abkhazia was an autonomous Soviet Republic of Georgia and South Ossetia an autonomous oblast. As the Soviet Union was losing its republics to the rise of nationalism, its republics themselves also began to lose autonomous parts of their own territories, including Abkhazia and South Ossetia, the latter of whom began proceedings to form its own parliament in 1990. Now, South Ossetia isn't one of Georgia's declared provinces, so Georgia's Supreme Soviet responded by abolishing the autonomy of South Ossetia. Georgian and Ossetian militias rose up on both sides to consolidate their control over the region. In January 1991, Georgia sent police forces in from outside South Ossetia to try to end any conflict before it began, but it eventually escalated and that summer they sent in their military. They burned residential buildings and paramilitaries of both ethnic groups cut off electricity and water to villages inhabited by the other. The fighting came to an end in June 1992, when both sides signed a Russian brokered ceasefire in the city of Sochi. It halted further military action by either side, gave de facto independence to South Ossetia in the area that its militias controlled, and a joint control commission was appointed as a neutral peacekeeper. At the same time, the northwestern region of Abkhazia, which was one of Georgia's declared provinces, was seeking an independence mandate of its own. Abkhazians had been unhappy at Georgia's decision in 1989 to turn its capital Sukhumi's University into an extension of the University of Tbilisi, Georgia's capital. Georgia was also growing wary of nationalists in Abkhazia seeing South Ossetia free themselves of Georgian rule. In June of 1992, the same month as the Sochi Agreement, tensions boiled over as Abkhaz nationalists attacked Georgia's government buildings in Sukhumi and Abkhazia declared independence the following month. In August, Georgia sent troops into Abkhazia, including prison inmates that were released under the condition that they fight there. Georgia's forces eventually captured the capital Sukhumi and the breakaway government moved to Gidauta. Decentralized militias from each side inflicted horrific violence on civilians from the other, including widespread ethnic cleansing attempts of Georgians by Abkhaz militias. During this, Georgia had to fight another war within its own declared borders against its first president, Vyadgam Sukhurja, who had been exiled in 1992. He returned to the Georgian city of Zugdidi in September 1993 and rallied his own rebel militias to try to overthrow his unpopular replacement, Edward Shevardnadze. Georgia was too focused on the war in Abkhazia to resist him and his militias took over a large part of western Georgia, including half of its remaining coastline. Georgia was eventually forced to compromise its efforts in Abkhazia to defeat the Zviadi rebels. This, along with some of the brutal ethnic cleansing tactics, allowed Abkhazia to gain control of most of its declared territory, including Sukhumi, and it became de facto independent from Georgia following a Russian and UN brokered ceasefire after months of negotiations in Geneva, New York City and then Moscow. But Russia's involvement may not have been limited to brokering the ceasefire. Allegations have been made that Russia was using this war as a method of keeping Georgia as a geopolitical ally. 
When the Soviet Union lost de facto jurisdiction over its 15 republics, 11 of them formed the Commonwealth of Independent States, or CIS. The four who didn't were the three Baltic states who had never joined, as well as Georgia. Following the Soviet collapse, Russia wanted Georgia to join the CIS and Georgia's crisis in Abkhazia led to internal pressure on the government to do so in pursuit of military assistance from Russia. This Human Rights Watch report alleges that Russia deliberately kept this war going in order to push Georgia towards military alignment by giving funding and weapons to the Abkhaz militias, creating more of a problem for Georgia and leading to more urgent appeals for Russian backing. Russia eventually persuaded Georgia to join the CIS and in exchange provided Georgia with weapons and military assistance. So while Russia was officially neutral, its arms ended up in the hands of both sides as part of its pursuit of asserting its influence in the former Soviet territories. Following the ceasefire, Abkhazia, South Ossetia and Georgia retained the territory under their control, which loosely mirrored the breakaway states' declared borders. The conflicts remained this way until 2008. War broke out again in the two regions at the same time. This time the alliances were much less blurred. Georgia had had a pro-Western government in place since 2003 and Vladimir Putin had been president of Russia since 2000. These deeply contrasting systems would set the stage for this conflict to reignite, as would Russia's newly established relations with both breakaway states. On August 1st, gunfire erupted from both sides on the de facto border between Russia and South Ossetia, which led to continued fighting for the next week. Georgia's president Mikhail Saakashvili called for a ceasefire with the South Ossetian forces, but all that followed were attacks on Georgian villages. On August 8th, both Georgia and Russia launched invasions into South Ossetia, both claiming the other side was there first. Georgia also claimed it had to protect Georgians living there. The next day, Abkhazia's military opened up a front against Georgia here, and Russia sent troops through Abkhazia to occupy the military base near the Georgian town of Sanaki. Georgia quickly backed down by announcing it would leave South Ossetia, but Russia continued its military operations beyond South Ossetia and Abkhazia and occupied parts of Georgia proper, despite President Medvedev announcing that all military operations had come to an end in Georgia, as well as a French brokered ceasefire signed on August 12th. Following this though, little changed in the front lines and Russia eventually ended its occupation over the next 10 days, but Georgia was unable to reclaim South Ossetia and Abkhazia as both states consolidated their control over the claimed land and Russia formally recognised both as independent nations on August 26th. Since then, only four other UN members have recognised the two states as independent nations. Georgia has been seeking NATO membership since 2005, but this ongoing dispute has derailed that process, something that Medvedev has cited when justifying Russia's role in the conflict. 